Welcome to the Medical Mnemonist Podcast, brought to you by Med School Coach. Each episode, take a journey into the top techniques for medical mnemonics, study skills, board exam tips, and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Welcome back to episode three of this mini series, of this audio course, really, because we're giving you homework every episode. And if you're not interacting with these homework assignments, if you're not completing them, you are not going to develop these skills as much as you would like. Maybe not at all. So if you haven't listened to the past two episodes on how to start off creating your own visual mnemonics, especially if you've never done this before, and episode two with utilizing some of these skills to develop our first skill set, which is the PEG system, and of course writing all of this in your memory journal because we will need to reference this material later on. And it's a great way to just monitor your progress over time. So go back and do those if you have not yet. And today we are going to cover the mind map. Now, mind maps are in basic structure, very similar to maybe a bubble map or a concept map, but they're much more powerful than those. And unfortunately, if you ever run across the book Mind Maps for Medical Students, those are concept maps. They're not mind maps. And it's unfortunate that they stole the title because I really would have liked to create a book about that for all of you with the appropriate title at some point. But we are going to cover that here. And you can go back to a few previous episodes where we covered mind maps and get more details from our expert interviews. But we're going to start off very simply here. What is a mind map? How to create one? and maybe get you started creating a few for your homework assignment later in the episode. So the basic structure of a mind map being similar to a concept map is that it not only makes associations of topic to subtopic and subtopic to even further subtopics down the road, but it also seems to add sort of a magnitude of difference in some ways. And the mind map adds the extra artistic benefit, which is going to be stronger for our visual memories as well, of different color schemes and different images, including possibly some of our visual markers. And one really cool benefit of mind maps is you can use it kind of like a zooming in and zooming out function. You can attach one mind map to another. Let's say you have a main concept in the center of one mind map, and you have different subcategories or these subtopics that branch out from it. It's like a spider web that branches out from the central theme that you've written down on a piece of paper. And then those can branch out further, but you might run into the end of a piece of paper at some point, even if you have a large poster board that you're writing on. But what you can do is start with a new piece of paper and use that subcategory from the previous page as a new main category on this new mind map. So in this aspect, these different maps that you might create in the future can all connect to each other. And they act very much like a Prezi presentation, if you've ever seen that, instead of PowerPoint, where it can zoom in and zoom out, and it really gives you a stronger sense of the association between different topics, especially if they're maybe twice removed from each other or something along those lines. So we can kind of move from the macro level to the micro level, or zoom back out to the macro level. One of the examples that Barry Mapp gave, ironic name for someone that's a map making expert or a mind map expert, is that if we were to take the concept of medicine as our main concept, he would actually take it one step removed from there. He would just say healthcare in general. What are all the different topics that you could branch out from in healthcare in some sort of spider web, mind map, concept map type of deal? So with healthcare, we could branch out into medicine, into exercise, into other kinds of therapies, into the politics of medicine, into healthcare reform, into a bunch of different topics, right? And then we can take one of those subcategories, such as medicine, and then create a new mind map with that as the central theme, as the central bubble, so to speak, and branch out from there. What is implemented in medicine? Or maybe we just want to focus on medical education. What are the different specialties or the different disciplines, pathology, pharmacology, anatomy, biochemistry? Those can be our subtopics. Really, it's up to you how you want to create it, and there are infinite ways to create these. 
but the basic structure, and you can create multiples for the same topic too if you want to, or if you run out of space, so don't feel limited by your creativity. The basic structure is that concept map spider web sort of design. You branch out into subcategories, and those branch out into subcategories, and further and further down the road. So maybe on one map, I have medical education branching out into all the disciplines, and then the disciplines branch out into main categories of that discipline, maybe main chapters in your textbook, for instance. I could get way down in the weeds and say, all right, within microbiology, I have gram-positive, gram-negative, and all the other forms that we're going to have with bacteria, and the different forms of viral shapes and However we want to categorize them, whether it be by the RNA and DNA for viruses or the types of capsules they have for bacteria and for other structures, we can get into the parasites and the fungi. And then we can go even further. What are the diseases that each one causes? What are the treatments for each one? What are the tests that need to be done? So as you see, as we create more and more mind maps and we get further and further into the complexities of them, it's really infinite how you want to structure these. But the main thing that we want to focus on here, the main difference that makes these stronger associations and stronger visuals than the typical concept map is the use of more visually stimulating structures and images. So it's really difficult to fully explain all of the aspects of a mind map in an audio format. So I do suggest if you would like to find out more about this, Look up Tony Buzon and his books because he coined the term mind map, even though there are similar concepts potentially being used in other places, he has a very clear cut book with a lot of visual imagery for you to look at and to get examples from. So I'm going to do my best to continue on with the audio explanation of what these look like. You can pause it right now and search mind map on your phone or browser and just see what one looks like. And that'll give you a better idea of these further definitions. And then your homework is going to be to create at least one of these later on. So let's go back to the example of microbiology. And in microbiology, you know, we have the gram positives, we have the gram negatives, we have the spirochetes and a couple other bacterial forms if you want to organize these by structures. And there's no need to do it that way. That's just traditionally how a lot of textbooks do it. You can do it by disease form or by location of the bacteria where it's found, like what types of mucosal cells or other cells that it likes to infect. Whatever organization you want to use that works for your organizational structure in your brain is perfectly fine. Many microbiology textbooks typically structure these in a few different ways, and one of them is by the gram stain or by the staining technique used to diagnose the bacteria. And then further from there, it goes into the shape of the bacteria, and further from there, it goes into the exact species and all of that. So let's say if we're using medical microbiology, so specifically the bugs that we're interested in that make humans sick, that cause pathology for us, our first subcategory or subtopic that's going to branch out from this main topic of microbiology are going to be the gram positives and the gram negatives and the spirochetes and a few others, depending on what resource you're using. But then we also want to color coordinate each one of these because that'll help us later on remember what location it is on our mind map if we're trying to picture it visually and just help clump everything together in a more systematic way. So we can use maybe the red and blue for the gram positive and gram negative, because that's pretty common. And maybe we want to use something weird like purple for spirochetes. So now everything in these subcategories, these subtopics, are color coordinated. So everything that is a subtopic to this subtopic is going to remain in that same color. So for instance, again with the spirochetes, if we're making that purple, then when we start labeling the different types of spirochetes, all of those are going to be purple, and so on and so forth. And you basically end up with this sort of color wheel looking aspect where the entire pie chart is going on of different colors based on how you structured the color organization for your particular mind map. But on top of this, we're going to add an image to each pathway. So in a concept map, you have the main concept and there's just a line that goes to the subtopic. And then there's a line that goes to that subtopic's subtopic. 
and so on and so forth. And it creates kind of that spider web look. But we're going to make those lines colorful and we're going to add images on each line. So for spiral key, it's, well, these are spirals. So the first thing that really comes to my mind is maybe a corkscrew. And we can draw that corkscrew along the line, along that pathway to the spirochetes bubble, that subtopic. And then when we subcategorize into different spirochetes, we can have different visual markers for each one. And it's just adding a little more creativity. It's adding more personalization, which is going to increase your long-term memory, assuming that you use space repetition with these mind maps as well. And in later episodes, we're going to talk about how these can work with other mnemonic devices, such as a memory palace. You can actually create memory palaces with mind maps, or you can place your mind map within a memory palace, just to give a few examples. So if you're like me and incredibly artistically handicapped, then don't worry about what it looks like. Just try to have little stick figures, have some sort of representation. If you've done the past two episodes worth of homework assignments, you've had a little bit of practice on creating visual markers for rare or conceptual information as we did in episode one. And then we practice a little bit in episode two, creating several different types of visual markers for a particular concept, which in that case was a number value. We created the looks like, seems like, and sounds like visual images for each of the number values. So with that practice, now try to do it for more complex and medically specific topics. Try to use those skills that you developed in the first two episodes, the first two weeks, for these microbiology topics or whichever topic you decide to pick for your practice mind map. Make sure to get some different colored pencils or markers or something so you can color coordinate these. And yes, you can use software for this, but it tends to be a little tricky and a little limited to use in my experience. I would much prefer that you write these out and you can place them on your wall in your bedroom or if they're completely terrible, you can hide them away and never show anyone. It doesn't matter because this is just practice. You can always recreate one later on that's a little more to your appreciation. So your homework assignment is to create at least one mind map, and preferably two or three because you're not going to really develop all of the skills just from one. In fact, I've heard that you need to create a thousand of these before you become an expert. And not that we need to be experts, but the more you create, the more proficient you will be. Practice with non-consequential material maybe with your weekly schedule you can have a different week as each subcategory or with your shopping list all of the produce are going to be in this category all of the non-perishables are going to be in this category and so on and so forth your toiletries and another one you can create mind maps for just about anything so just get to it just practice a little try to find those visual associations that you want to link to each branch into another subcategory. And of course, we'll be writing these down. If you have larger paper, utilize those. You don't need to actually write these in your memory journal because they might get too big for that. But do keep them for reference. And we'll come back to all three of these past episodes material in future episodes. And for your practice, I want you to try to, after creating the mind map and sticking it somewhere, whether it be on your wall or under your bed in your closet, try to close your eyes and recall the topics that you had and where they were on the mind map, because that's the practice that we're going to use for reviewing our medically based mind maps down the road. You want to be able to close your eyes and basically picture these just like you would a visual mnemonic or a sketchy or picmonic image. All right, that's about it for today's episode. And in the next part, we're going to go into some more advanced strategies. So if you haven't done the past three weeks, next week's might be a little difficult for some of you. I would recommend going back and doing those, giving yourself some time to process, to review the work you've done. Maybe you'll come back and make some changes to previous works, or maybe just recreate a list or an image or something that you had there previously. That's perfectly fine. That's going to happen, especially a lot when you're starting off. So do check the show notes for more resources. Of course, you can check out Read This Before Medical School, our study guide that has a lot of these advanced mnemonic techniques in it, as well as board exam techniques and other study skills. Basically, the last two plus years of research that we've done, a lot of it has been condensed into that book, and we're trying to update it from time to time as well. And if you would like our free essentials guide, 
PDF download. You can get that at freemeded.org slash medstudents. And I'll see you next week. The Medical Mnemonist Podcast is powered by Med School Coach. To access Med School Coach services, including USMLE tutoring and residency admissions advising, visit our website at medschoolcoach.com. Good luck as you prepare for your board exams, and we hope you tune in again next time.